Blog Talk Radio. Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and every major podcast provider. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player on our website, which is www.theorganicview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, send us a tweet on Twitter to at the organic view, or simply call into the show at area code 917-932-1068. Today I'm going to be talking to Jay Feldman from Beyond Pesticides. Uh, he is the executive director and has a 30-year history of working with communities nationwide on toxics, organic policies, and agricultural practices that maintain ecological balance, biodiversity, and avoid reliance on toxic chemicals. Now, there are a myriad of theories about the actual cause of colony collapse disorder. Each cause is beginning to fit nicely under the effects of a new family of pesticides. For the past three decades, Beyond Pesticides, which is actually formerly National Coalition Against the Misuse of Pesticides, has been diligently addressing the impact of these chemicals and the process by which they are allowed registration. The organization's primary goal is to effect change through local action, assisting individuals and community-based organizations to stimulate discussion on the hazards of toxic pesticides while providing information about safe alternatives. So I'd like to welcome to the show Mr. Jay Feldman, uh, who has so much experience um, just with pesticides, with educating the public, and just, you know, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things. So I would like to welcome Jay to the show. Jay, good afternoon, and welcome to The Organic View. Good afternoon. Thank you. We're pleased to be here. Jay, can you talk about your background, how you got involved with the work that you're doing um, so that our audience can uh, learn more about you and all the wonderful things that you've done throughout your career. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, my involvement with pesticides really goes back to the late 1970s when I was working with a group that was advancing health protections for farm workers. And we back a group called Rural America. Uh, at that time, we were working with EPA. We, you know, we just had a national election, and President Jimmy Carter was elected, and there was a lot of enthusiasm, something similar to what we experienced a couple of years ago in this country. And they at EPA had been under a lot of pressure over the years to better protect farm workers. So they were trying to create a political base and an informational base to begin developing worker protection standards. Now, understand, up until that point, that was one. there was one page in the Code of Federal Regulations that governed uh, pesticide safety for farm workers, and that basically said farm workers shall not reenter the fields until the dust have settled and the sprays have dried. No real science behind that, and so we went out across the country and we talked with farm workers and we brought in panels of federal and state officials to listen really for the first time uh, to farm workers directly about the hazards that they were suffering in the fields as a result of exposure to pesticides, drift into their into the labor camps, into their homes, kids uh, hanging out at the edges of fields for lack of daycare, sitting in cars while their parents worked in the fields. And... Later, I guess several years later, after all that data was collected, EPA did actually adopt a formal farm worker protection standard with more rigorous reentry standards, access to clean drinking water, hand washing uh, facilities, and things of that nature. There's still a long way to go, but um, that was my original in- involvement, and clearly from the very from the get-go in listening to both small farmers and farm workers' experiences about their exposure, the nausea, the dizziness, the disorientation from pesticide exposure, and seeing the inability of the local, state, and federal officials to respond in any sort of positive way, I had the opportunity, being based in Washington, to bring that sense of outrage back to Washington, D.C., and we actually held hearings uh, now, where you know the pesticide issue is governed by the uh, Agriculture Committee in both the House and the U.S. Senate, 
which tells you a lot, and we can talk about that. It, it tells you who manages issues of public health and environmental protection. That is, those who are the biggest promoters of pesticide dependency in the country have oversight and regulatory and statutory authority over uh, pesticide use. So I was in my 20s back then and believing that, you know, the democratic process works. You, you take these experiences, the the so-called horror stories, the experiences that people have had in the fields, and you bring it to a deliberative body in the U.S. Congress, and you seek to reform the laws that have allowed these outrages to go on day in and day out. And that's what we've been doing ever since. I mean, you know, it, we realize uh, as an organization, and I, I certainly realize from my own personal experience, that it really takes a lot of engaged people to make the changes that uh, that need to occur in this country. Just to round out the story, after after doing that for several years, it became very clear that if we as an organization did not start focusing on advancing alternatives effectively, that just our efforts to offer better restrictions to farm workers and people that are living in, you know, in those conditions or contiguous to treated areas, agricultural areas, that the improvement of, con of restrictions alone was not going to offer the kind of protection that we need in this country. And so we spent, we, we began spending a lot of time promoting alternatives like sustainable ag, uh, helped write the Organic Farming Act and the Agricultural Productivity Act, which started the Low Input Sustainable Agriculture Program at USDA and then went on to work with folks uh, on writing the Organic Foods Production Act about a decade later. Again, all with the assumption that unless we began a shift away from pesticide dependency, we wouldn't be able to solve a lot of the problems that were being experienced by people who were directly being poisoned uh, in the fields. So not only were you addressing a problem, but you were also providing solutions, which is very important because there are a lot of organizations that will just attack issues, but they don't provide solutions. So that's very positive and also reinforcing. Uh, now, in addition to that, uh, just out of curiosity, actually, I'd like to know what was the response from the big agricultural, the, the big agrochemical companies? Well, you know, first of all, to fill in the story a little bit, that original work that I referenced back in the 70s was actually funded by EPA, as they say, under the new administration that had come in. But as soon as we went out into central Florida, into the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, and into the Salinas Valley in California, the White House began hearing about this project. And, uh, you know, 40 or more uh, congressional offices descended on the White House and for those of your listeners who remember, uh, back in those days, and I guess it's not that different today, uh, people with grand ideas and great ideas often backpedal when faced with, um, you know, pushback uh, by the, the companies that are affected, multinationals in this case, and by the moneyed interests. And, you know, so that's, that's what happened. Um, we were defunded. Um, the project was defunded, which, you know, silver lining in that for me, of course, is that given my high level of, uh, of emotional investment in this after having traveled around the country for a year meeting with farm workers and small farmers, was to begin with others the formation of, of the organization. As you mentioned, National Coalition Against the Issues of Pesticides, which became Beyond Pesticides. That's a story interesting as well because the name was chosen with with a you know as a strategic move because we understood back then that you couldn't really talk about organic um and pass the laugh test on capitol hill i mean it, it there's a sort of a saying in this town uh in dc that really the only thing that you have uh when you go up to capitol hill is your credibility and some people try to, you know, they associate different things with credibility. But, of course, in our case, uh, not having money, which does uh, unfortunately uh, associate itself with credibility in our uh, legislative bodies, uh, not having money, we are really careful with, you know, the positions we take. 
and yet want to want to push the envelope and force uh, consideration of issues that might not otherwise be be seeing the light of day if the multinationals had their way. So it was, but so that was our role. That was our niche. But if you look back historically, and this still happens today, you know, some of the big organizations fearful that their credibility could be undermined did not feel comfortable back in the late 70s, early 80s, advancing organic in the in the agriculture uh, committee. We couldn't find anybody, literally, to sit beside um, uh, Bob Rodale, the head of Rodale Press, and myself uh, in the public interest community to support organic back then um, of, the, of the major organizations. Now, thankfully, that's changed a lot, but it's changed because of grassroots activism and grassroots involvement. It hasn't changed because of a bunch of folks sitting in a room in D.C. or a state capital somewhere who are trying to figure out what the, what the barometer reading is and based on who they believe will pass what. And I feel very strongly about this, that the role of public interest groups that are supported with dollars from people who hard, hard-earn money, you know, supporting public interest groups as a charity must be looking to those groups to change what's, po- what's politically feasible, not to do what's politically feasible. And unfortunately, too much of public interest really is uh, literally a barometer reading of what is possible. And our goal here, and has been from the beginning, is to change what's possible. And that's why people support organizations, I believe, is because they're, they're, they believe that there's some problem out there that needs fixing, that their health has been compromised, their children are at risk, current practices and policies are inadequately protective, and they want to step in and advance changes that are protective. You can't do that by taking a barometer reading. The compromises are are too severe and too undermining to your end goal purpose. Uh, I'll give you a a real-life example today that we're dealing with. We've come to realize over the years that the use of risk assessment, and actually the early people in policy acknowledge this, that the use of risk assessment is filled with so many uncertainties that we cannot adequately be protective of the public by relying on some of the assumptions and the lack of attention to many, many issues that go hand-in-hand with risk assessment. So, for instance, we might know that, um, you know, a pesticide at a certain level of exposure causes an acute effect, and we can establish a lethal dose for that acute effect. However, we have learned over the years that we don't know uh, that there are what the effects are from mixtures of chemicals. We don't know if there are synergistic reactions. We know in the labor- laboratory that there, yes, can be synergistic reactions, meaning that the mixture of those chemicals can cause a greater effect and even a different effect than exposure to the individual chemicals in that mixture on their right. own. And so we're seeing this with hermaphrodism in frogs, where University of uh, California Berkeley professor Tyrone Hayes has found uh, synergistic effects, as has University of Wisconsin um, a zoologist uh, Warren Porter, both seeing synergistic effects uh, in their laboratory. Uh, but, but EPA does not test for synergy. And so right from the get-go, we know that there's a huge deficiency in risk assessment. And so what are we doing? We're introducing chemical reform policy that accepts that deficiency and tries to improve the level of attention to risk assessment by doing some important things, like looking at aggregate risk. In other words, what is our exposure to a chemical across all food uses, non-dietary non- and dietary exposure. That's a good thing when we do that. But if at the end of the day we've advanced protection, uh, providing for elevated uh, protection for children, 
recognizing that they are more vulnerable uh, being in the developmental phases of life. If we do those good things and at the same time leave a huge gaping hole because it's not politically feasible or EPA says it's not viable to uh, conduct uh, uh, studies on synergistic effects, then at the end of the day, what have we achieved? We still are exposing the population to a toxic chemical that they're ingesting, inhaling, absorbing through their skin on a daily basis, day in, day out, with incomplete knowledge. I mean, up until recently, EPA uh, had not had a protocol for looking at endocrine disruption. You've heard about endocrine disruption. Mm -hmm. um, the, the interesting thing about it, the endocrine system, of course, is it's a message system for our bodies. Mm. And so if we play with the endocrine dis system, we can cause all kinds of uh, issues uh, around uh, organ development, cancer later in life, uh, learning disabilities, uh, you know, issues of sexual development, a range and range of issues uh, relating to this, and it became clear uh, as scientists looked at endocrine disruptors that it defied classical toxicology, which we all hear all the time, you know, when you crack open a toxicology textbook that the dose makes the poison. And so many in the chemical industry tell us, well, yeah, the, we agree, these chemicals are toxic, they're poisonous, but the level to which we're exposed is so minuscule that it can have an effect at that low dose. Well, well, let me ask you a question, Jay. Um, yeah. Just on that point alone, with the chemical clothianidin, which has a cumulative effect, uh, yeah. it, it wouldn't matter if it's a small dose or a large dose. The right. fact of the matter is it's cumulative. So over right. time, uh, obviously, we're ma you know, our physical body mass is by far much, much more greater than that of a honeybee, but the bottom line is because it's cumulative, it will build up in our system and it can't, it's irreparable. So, right. you know, what are your thoughts about that? Because it, it Well, that's an, important, that's an important point. And, you know, I, I, just to finish the thought, and, and I think clothianidin is a really good example of deficiencies uh, in both the way we look at toxicological impacts on humans and, the, and wildlife, but also how the policy has failed us. Uh, but just to finish on the endocrine disruption issue, the, the, the issue here is that dose does not make the poison in this case. It's a question of inverse dose response, a question of timing. In other words, mm. if you're exposed to minuscule doses at windows of vulnerability during developmental phases, you're going to cause an effect uh, with an estrogen mimic uh, that is at the wrong place at the wrong time, and that will affect uh, development. But you're, you're raising another issue that is, is classic to our, our deficiencies from a regulatory standpoint, and that is you know, the ability, on the one hand, to evaluate uh, a chemical, uh, chemicals like the neonicotinoids, which are systemic, uh, which, as you point out, which means that it translocates into the plant, is incorporated into the plant, incorporated into the pollen, incorporated into the fruit of the plant, and therefore leaves a, a residue that uh, is, is, a, is a constant and therefore being absorbed by the honeybee that is, is um, pollinating as well as the human population that's exposed as a result of ingestion of the of the fruit. N yeah, not you can't wash it off. You can't right. cut the peel off. Right. It's actually in the, the in the fruit itself. Exactly. And as soon as we ingest it, it's in our bodies. And, you know, people that don't quite understand it, it it's interesting how many people will cringe if they see a pregnant woman smoking. But the fact of the matter is when they eat a non-organic yeah. apple, <laughs> what do you think you're doing, folks? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting you know, when you get into these issues, you see how imperfect the science is and how deficient it really is. Not, not that it can't tell us a lot, but the uncertainties and unknowns are, are astronomical. And by the way, that is the underlying motivator for the European Union's precautionary approach and the precautionary principle, which has really been 
embraced. Uh, you know, they have a long way to go in implementing it, but at least from a policy standpoint, the concept of, of first do no harm and to try to do an adequate uh, alternatives assessment to determine up front whether, whether there's any essentiality or need for a pesticide in light of the availability of alternative practices, whether they be organic or some other type of, of system. Um, you know, we, we, we're having a big debate in this country about atrazine. Atrazine is a, an herbicide that's basically contaminated the water in uh, major water supplies all across the country. The likelihood is if you're drinking water today, you're drinking atrazine. And, you know, we're going to have a long debate uh, as people, as cancer rates continue, uh, even at the status quo, if cancer rates are to continue, we're seeing, you know, 25% of the population, uh, you know, getting cancer, 30% dying prematurely from cancer. We shouldn't be broadcasting carcinogens in the environment like this. And yet the question is never asked, are there alternatives, are there alternatives to atrazine? And one of the things that's happened here is that, you know, you, you get the uh, one problem being the chemical company stepping in and trying to solve a problem by creating another one. So, for instance, with uh, soil erosion, we, you know, we invented this idea of no-till agriculture, and we said, well, we're not going to have, we're not going to move this, disturb the soil because we don't want to cause soil erosion, which is true. We shouldn't cause soil erosion. But the solution became a chemical solution. Uh, No-till farming, you use herbicides, you bring the herbicides in, and you uh, then don't have to till. Meanwhile, there are a bunch of farmers in Iowa, practical farmers of Iowa, that are saying, wait a minute, you know, our chemical use has gone up tremendously. We may not have soil erosion, but we're surely seeing runoff of these chemicals into our waterways. So what, what's the difference here? Um, which, again, trading one problem for another. And so exactly. here... Exactly. And- uh, they developed, is, yeah, they yeah, developed ahead. something called ridge till farming, which is, you know, envision a um, a depression in a ridge, and you you plant the crop at the top of the ridge, and in between those rows, which is the depression, you plant plant a nitrogen fixing legume, like clover. It it fixes nitrogen, right? which we, we tend to use a lot of synthetic nitrogen in no-till farming, it fixes nitrogen naturally, and it takes care of weed control without herbicides. There are solutions is the point here. We're well, not looking solutions, at solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, I remember uh, about two months ago I interviewed uh, some of the fellows that are on the board of the North American Hemp Industrial Council, and I had the chairman on the show, um, and it's just interesting how hemp is, uh, it can be imported, but it cannot be grown on U.S. soil. The DEA will not permit it, even though industrial hemp has nothing right. to do with marijuana, and it's a crop that can be grown uh, easily without pesticides and has so many benefits could be used for food, it could be used for uh, textiles, there's so many uses for it, and it's cheap to grow. But, you know, once again, another a very good alternative that, uh, because of certain powers that be, will not allow it because of other special interest groups that don't want to see it. Yeah, another good example, yes. And, you know, that's, that's where I think the issue of promoting alternatives has to grow from the grassroots. You know, here we have a bee problem, okay, and we're seeing colony collapse disorder. We're seeing real-life problems that beekeepers are telling us about on a daily basis. And, you know, the best EPA can do in, this, in all of this over the last several, I mean, many years now, we're talking a half a dozen years at least, is announce, as they did a week or so ago, announced that they're going to have an improved certification and training program for pesticide applicators. And they're going to do a better job of, uh, they're going to try to do a better job of, you know, creating oversight of the, st the, the states that are responsible for enforcing pesticide law. They have delegated responsibility under a fe federal pesticide law 
most of those uh, grants that go to the states actually go to the Departments of Agriculture, which are the enforcement agencies, except for states like uh, New York, California, Connecticut, where it's a Department of Environment or a Department of, of um, uh, EPA, a Department of Environmental Protection. So, you know, we we have um, this this sort of narrow view that the agency has assumed that this problem can be corrected through better application methods, perhaps better enforcement. And in effect, when we're talking about systemic pesticides, those issues, while important, you know, certainly, uh, we shouldn't be spraying pesticides while flowers are in bloom. But when we're talking, again, as you mentioned, a systemic pesticide, it's a moot point. The seeds uh, are soaked in the stuff, so it, right. it's kind of moot. And right. it's just interesting because, you know, if if it were the case that the EPA, who I have enjoyed a wonderful relationship with, with uh, many different uh, areas here in New York, especially with my composting projects, uh, the higher-ups, I had invited Ms. Kimberly Neshi to come on the show to have a nice little friendly chat with my good friend Tom Theobald, Graham White, and also Dr. Hank Tenekis, uh, the Dutch toxicologist who basically uh, provided you know, rock-solid proof about the damage that clothianidin and all these systemic, systemic pesticides do. And I received a message from Dale Kemery back on February 24th that um, while they appreciate my interest in the EPA, they are declining the interview. So that tells me if they don't want to talk, why is it that they don't want to talk? What is it that they don't want to say? Yeah. Now, EPA will tell you that it does not have the authority to do what we want it to do, that it basically is charged with mitigating risks, uh, that in effect it is an agency that must register pesticides and attempt to mitigate, reduce, control risks to a level of acceptability. And it does that through a means of evaluating risk uh, and a number of assumptions about exposure patterns and uh, use patterns of these chemicals. Now, that is the culture of the agency. It is more culture than law because, in effect, the agency is governed by an unreasonable adverse effects standard to protect man and the environment. Man is their, their words, not mine. But the, the idea being that um, the agency is presumably looking at risks and benefits and making a determination that once it does that, that the uses are reasonable or that the exposures and harm that is caused by those uses are reasonable. Now, that, that's a really interesting issue because unreasonable is a huge word. To me, it's unreasonable to expose somebody to a toxic material or the wildlife or cause in any way, shape, or form adverse impacts on bee, honeybee, and pollinator health if there's a non-toxic or less toxic means of achieving the pest management goal. So, in effect, you've got a culture that is assumed that unreasonable is determined by what the market will bear. So, in this case, you've got a situation where the, the agency, EPA, does not even look at uh, the benefits in any type of independent way with an independent analysis. What it does is it assumes that if something, a toxic chemical, sells in the marketplace, if people buy it, then it has benefit, and therefore all the agency needs to concern itself with is uh, the toxic effects. Now, there's one exception to this as the agency has adopted or interpreted their authority, and that is in the case of public health uses. So if there's a chemical that's being marketed for public health protection, let's say it's an insect-borne disease, uh, which is uh, often, I, I hate to use that example because often the insect-borne disease issue is overblown and really not adequately evaluated. But uh, let's say it's a rodent issue or, you know, where there is a carrier, SARS, or some, some type of infectious disease, then, um, you know, then the agency does 
ask the registrant, which is the chemical manufacturer, to provide to it information on the benefits. Show that it really works and show theoretically that it works over time because here's the Achilles heel in all of this. That is that in all, virtually all pesticides that have been registered since the beginning of time, arsenic-based products, so organochlorines, organophosphates, synthetic pyrethroids, and it will be true with neonicotinoids, is the development of resistance. Insect resistance, we see it uh, with the phenoxy herbicides and weed resistance, or I should say unwanted plant resistance. And that, that scenario of resistance means that over time, we will see lack of efficacy, lack of benefit to those products. But without EPA evaluating these things, without EPA evaluating whether there is a less toxic alternative way, whether we, don't, whether we need the thing or not, whether there are alternatives that can be utilized, we end up in a series of emergency scenarios. The emergency scenario we're going through right now is you've heard you live in New York City, you've heard it, bed bugs. If you get on the EPA website, because the situation is so bad, the agency has to recognize that virtually all pesticides on the market today uh, have sh shown resistance. Insect resistance is being seen in virtually all pesticides registered for bed bugs uh, in the United States. Why has that happened? because our dependency on pesticides as a solution is short-lived, it's short-sighted, and it doesn't lead to the kind of sustainability that most people are looking for in their own lives today and would like to see our policymakers embrace this notion that we must live for the next generation, you know, and we are living pest to pest when it comes to the pesticide program. You show up with a toxic chemical and EPA will register it as long as you've decided that it's worth the, as the, as the registrants like to tell us, the millions of dollars it costs the registrant to go through product, you know, development and, um, you know, research and development that's necessary to bring that product to market. It's a flawed system. It's failed. It's institutionally corrupt um and of course culture. it's corrupt and and jay if you look at commercials on tv if you look at companies like the bear corporation who it used to be that you would see commercials for their their migraine and aspirin and whatnot and now all of a sudden you see birth control you see all sorts of different chemicals so they go from chemicals for that that are used as uh pesticides to controlling the birth rate to yeah. <laughs> Controlling the headaches that you get from controlling the birth rate and controlling yeah. the pesticides. I mean, so. a lot of the pharmaceutical companies are companies that produce pesticides, and you know they they produce the chemicals that cause breast cancer and then produce tamoxifen uh, to you know protect you against cancer. And so you know it's it's a vicious cycle, and it certainly you you could argue it's a conflict of interest to be registering materials that cause a disease that then you then profit from uh, because you're able to provide a cure in people's desperation as they as they seek um, to hang on to their, their lives. Now, it's and really interesting. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you, on that very note, what would you recommend, especially given your expertise and the involvement that you have, what do you recommend be done with the organizations that are in charge of regulation? What do you propose could be done as far as these corporations are concerned to prevent them from so-called double dipping? Because in essence, you know, they're making you sick, they're providing you a cure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's criminal behavior as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, obviously in this political climate, um, it would be very difficult to do anything. But I, I think like when we talk about reform, like anything else, we should be talking about legislation that, that holds uh, corporations criminally liable for uh, causing diseases that then they try to profit from. Um, there, there should be no connection. There should absolutely 
be no connection uh, uh, between those two uh, the, those two types of products. One one viewed as a a side that kills, and one viewed as a a remedy that cures. It it, it it's it's counterintuitive. But you know that that is a huge undertaking, um, and we should not that we should step away from huge undertakings. But you know you're raising an issue that really asks a, a deep question about the whether we seek through our laws to incentivize uh, problems that undermine our health and protection of the environment, or that we we affirmatively create disincentives, and disincentives come in many forms. I mean, we could, you know, I could envision um, laws that prohibit the same companies uh, or sister companies or one that has any, you know, overlapping directorate or interlocking directorates um, uh, being allowed by law to, you know, register and then seek to cure uh, diseases that are caused by the chemicals they register. I, I could see criminality or, or criminal uh, charges being allowed in these cases where... I could totally see it, and I could totally see yeah. the blood-sucking attorneys coming out of the woodwork to cash in. But yeah, right. unfortunately, that is not the case at this point. But right. let me ask you a question, Jay, in regards to, for example, I had Percy Schmeiser on the yeah. show recently, and the bottom line, what Percy spoke about was the fact that um, if, you're a non, if you're an organic farmer and your neighbor is not and you have some of Monsanto's product uh, you know, growing on your neighbor's farm and it drifts on over and contaminates your organic farm, A, you have no protection, B, uh, you are now... Uh, you now have to deal with Monsanto because you have their stuff on your land. And the thing is, is that yeah. you know th there's no way of uh, to clean up, even if yeah. you were to cease using Monsanto seeds. Uh, just the environmental cleanup uh, is a long yeah. process. Not to mention, how does a farmer stay in business during that transition? You know, it's funny. It's not funny, but with the uh explosion of the Japanese uh, power plant and nuclear facility there, I think people get a really clear sense of how contamination can travel through the air and land on a site many miles from its source. Um, and I think we understand that uh, with the concept of radiation. Um, we're measuring uh, radiation levels in milk in the U.S. from fallout in Japan. Yeah, and then there's um, a report saying that there's nothing wrong with the milk, that, you know, a little right. bit of radiation well, might even because be good that, for you. Well, because that gets back to that risk assessment issue. But the question is, you know, again, and, and I think your former guest, Tom Theobald, has written about this um, with the uh, analogy to the the BP Deep Horizon oil well uh, explosion, and, you know, that is that there are analogies here that we've created uh, catastrophes that are virtually impossible to clean up that have uh, huge questions of sustainability associated with them and ability to live a life that is not intruded upon by uh, outside you know, factors that drift on us. We used to talk about pesticide drift, right? You know, and, and we still do with conventional pesticides that are found miles from the intended source. They're, they're, you know, pesticide residues from a farm are picked up in clouds and deposited in rain cross-continentally. They're sprayed in California and show up on the East Coast. So when we talk about target sites and limiting technology that has harm associated with it to the target site. We're certainly not talking about that with deep well oil injection. We're certainly not talking about that with nuclear power and, we're, and, and, and explosions associated with that. And we're certainly not talking about it when it comes to, to pesticides. We don't see it. <clears throat> we may not smell it. Uh, we may not feel it, but the exposures are, are occurring. Now, it, now along comes genetically modified organisms and Roundup Ready uh, products that are produced by Monsanto. And in that context, 
we were sold as a society. And by the way, I mean, we're seeing this around the world. We're seeing now um, land area the size of China planted in genetically modified organisms. The promise was that we would reduce pesticide use. And, you know, Roundup Ready means that a farmer can use that old no-till I was talking about earlier and uh, then spray uh, an herbicide uh, on, the, on the plant and not affect the plant, but only the unwanted uh, vegetation that grows up around the plant with uh, a chemical called glyphosate, which has problems of its own, um, a, a range of issues associated with cancer and neurological effects and issues associated with both its active ingredient, which is known as glyphosate, this is a Roundup product, and the so-called inert ingredients, which often make up the bulk of the formulation, not disclosed on the product label, and oftentimes more hazardous than the active ingredient, which is simply a term of art because all of the chemicals in that product are biocides, even though the chemical manufacturers identify a certain of those ingredients as the one ingredient that attacks the target pest or the several ingredients in many cases that attack the target pest. But at the end of the day, we're talking about a mixture of biocides, uh, typically, not, not always. I mean, sometimes we have inert ingredients that are harmless, but but we have uh, hun- uh, over a thousand inert ingredients um, that are, uh, are harmful uh, materials. And so we're, we're in a situation where we, we have this drift um, on a promise that it's reducing another ill, which is a pesticide that, uh, or the pesticides that the chemical companies are telling us you want to use less of, introduce this glyphosate or this Roundup is, a, is the uh, trade name, and lo and behold, we're using more Roundup and glyphosate than we've ever used before, and guess what's happening? Resistance. So now, now the this? chemical companies are introducing, in addition, they're introducing uh, other chemicals um, that they want uh, growers to use alongside their glyphosate. Of course they are. Jay, yeah. it's the oldest sales trick in the book. Yeah. It, it's kind of like uh, the encyclopedia salesman that used to come around many years ago. Uh, you know, you buy one book, you'll fall in love with it, blah, 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 and then before you know it, you're buying dictionaries, you're buying all sorts of different reference books, and, you know, then all of a sudden you get all sorts of magazines and this and that and the other thing, and before you know it, one thing just led to a huge, huge investment, and meanwhile, the salesperson is laughing all the way to the bank, and you're stuck with, <laughs> you know, a lot of, a, 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 a huge a uh, number of products that you may not necessarily have thought you wanted to begin with. Yeah. Um, you know, and it is a vicious cycle or, or a treadmill because, you know, one of, the, one of the alternatives they're recommending is a chemical called dicamba, which has problems of its own, but it too is already showing resistance in other, in other formats. So, you know, farmers are looking for solutions. They're not chemists. They often are not making these decisions on their own. There's uh, a heavy degree of reliance on the extension service, and historically the extension service has had a very close and cozy relationship with the chemical companies. Uh, There's a a report uh, once put out called Signs for Sale, which did a beautiful job of showing how the research dollars are coming from the chemical companies so that when a farmer calls up extension, um, the, the extension or the research scientists are talking to has often been funded by the chemical companies to develop uh, product lines or to do research that uh, is necessary for product registration. So their knowledge, you know, and this, you know, I, I'm not blaming the scientists per se. I mean, it, it's a vicious, vicious cycle in the sense that research scientists are looking for research dollars. And, you know, I I, I would assume that a lot of these guys would just as well like to work on the alternatives, but the money's in the chemicals. So at this point, we have the farmer who doesn't have the technical knowledge to make these decisions going to uh, what he believes is an unbiased source, getting information to jump on the chemical treadmill 
and then a few years down the road finds a chemical is necessary, goes back to the researcher who has in the intervening years gotten additional research dollars to move on to the next best chemical who advises the farmer to jump on the treadmill for the next chemical, the next greatest chemical. You know, neonicotinoids is an example of that. It's a relatively new family of chemicals that, you know, has been brought on the market because of resistance in in virtually all the chemicals that have preceded it. And so, you know, the cycle keeps repeating itself, and we, we call that the pesticide treadmill. But when you see that in all of this in the context of genetically modified organisms, it, it simply raises everything to the next level because not only are those systems highly dependent on the old pesticides uh, and new pesticides that are needed to replace the ones that have become resistant, but they are dri- – we're now seeing genetic drift. So, you know, yes, we've seen chemicals in the past that have long residual lives and find themselves in soils for long periods of time, for years and years, but now we're seeing genetic material drifting and changing the very nature of the organisms that we're planting. And that raises this whole discussion to a whole new level of involuntary exposure, involuntary impact. And unfortunately, I think because of the pressure that the industry has built up over time, the the institutions that are charged with regulating this and the individuals who run those institutions, I think, feel tremendous pressure to believe that these technologies, say organic, being a, a very sophisticated technology next to genetically engineered, being uh, 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 a, a sophisticated technology we, do, we know very, very, very little about, their belief, the regulator's belief right now, and this goes to the highest levels at USDA, is that these two can coexist without well, really impeding on each other's existence. Especially since uh, we have Vilsack as a former Monsanto executive. I mean, yeah. let's, let's call a spade a spade. You yeah. know, it, it's, it's a big contra- uh, conflict well, you know, of interest let's, let's when you have... This. Yeah, yeah I, I, I know his background, and you know, I think background accounts for a lot, but he also appointed Kathleen Merrigan as a deputy secretary and has given the charge through her to advance organic to a level that we've never seen before. The problem is, that these two personalities, if you will, that is the belief that organic is credible, it's viable, it should be supported by our, inst- our public institutions. It should be. And, and, and he will espouse that, our Secretary of Agriculture. At the same time, he believes just as strongly in the viability and importance of, of genetically modified organisms in agriculture. And the problem is... The problem, the problem is, is he hasn't masters, recognized Jay? that the two can't coexist. <laughs> Sorry. That's the bottom line. You can't yeah. serve two masters, and that's yeah. exactly yeah. what he's doing. And that's the boat we're in right now. And I think we see that in politics a lot. I think that's more of a political decision than a technical one. Because if you look through the environmental impact statement that supported the recent decision back in January by the um, Secretary of Agriculture to deregulate genetically modified alfalfa, you will see so much acknowledgement that we know so very little about the health and environmental effects of these organisms and what they will do, even though we know that they are drifting off the target site, uh, even though we know that those systems are more highly dependent on toxic chemicals for uh, invasive or you know, unwanted vegetation in agriculture, so-called weeds. You know, but regardless, you know, you know, the, the documentation is there. Anybody can go on the USDA website and, and website and see that environmental impact statement and how it really cries out to regulators to say, wait, just wait, be prudent, be precautionary. You know, do not jump into advancing genetically engineered food production like you did with pesticides, without having all the answers that we need at the front end. Exactly. And this, this is the history of pesticides being played out, uh, played out once again with uh, genetically modified organisms. It's, a, it's really a sad day. And uh, here, look, my hope goes back to, I, I've got to return to the grassroots, okay, because 
you know, we we had been struggling with a chemical named Alar. I don't know if you remember Alar, which was used uh, back in the early 90s, um, very widely used, uh, deminazide is a chemical name, for fruit ripening in apple production, essentially. It extended shelf life, and it also caused uniform ripening in fruit production. Didn't you know, its uses had some value in a, in a food production system that is not locally ba- based where we're trucking fruit around the world and around, across the country. Um, but be that as it may, uh, the data came out on dominizide as a carcinogen, and it sat, and it sat, and it sat uh, at EPA. Finally, 60 Minutes got a hold of a document and said, wait a minute, look at, the, look at this data on cancer. This is on, these numbers are off the chart. And so 60 Minutes did a piece. The next day, apples were pulled from the shelves. Uh, consumers were saying they wouldn't buy them. Um, farmers were hurting. They couldn't sell an apple in this country, conventional farmers. Now, who's, whose fault is that? Everybody was getting mad at the environmental groups. This wasn't who they should have been mad at. They should have been mad at their trade association the trade associations, the chemical companies, which kept this data under wraps, which kept EPA in a holding pattern for over a decade, uh, even though the chemical had been in special review. But the the moral of the story is, despite EPA's inaction, not only was that chemical removed from the market, but it really launched in this country an awareness on the part of consumers that they really ought to take a look at organic food production, and they ought to support it. And you know what, what happened at that time? It's not, and, and this is something we really have to be careful of when we talk about organic food. We're not just talking about residues of chemicals on the food that we eat or residues, um, and this is bringing us back to the honeybee and pollinator issue. We're not just talking about whether onions, which happens to be a commodity that has little if none uh, pesticide residue on the edible portion of the onion, Yet there are dozens, several dozen chemicals, toxic, carcinogens, neurotoxins, chemicals that pollute water, chemicals toxic to bees that are used in their production. And if we are driven as a society to to only ask, well, what's on my food, what residues are on my food, then we're not asking some of the basic questions that go to the heart of sustainability. What is used in the production of my food? How does it affect the environment that I rely on? How does it affect the environment that honeybees and pollinators rely on? What impact does it have on the workers who harvest the food that I eat? What are the impacts in other countries given global chemical transport around the world? These are questions organic consumers care about, and the media has gotten so defocused or focused in the wrong place. Jay, it's not that. They can't touch it. They can't touch it because the sponsorship for mainstream media is the chemical boys, point blank, plain and simple. And the thing is, is I've heard from many different people that, you know, love to talk about some of the stuff that you talk about, June, but just can't do it. Yeah. Because their funding is gone. My point is consumers can Okay, obviously the PR machine is huge on the chemical industry side, on multinational food production uh, producers. But at the end of the day, when I show up, you know, as, as Wendell Berry has said and many people quote all the time, eating is a, an agricultural act. And I would say eating is a political act in addition to that. That we make decisions every day about what we want for our future, not only our future health, but the future of the planet that sustains our health, and that the two are part of the web of life, and we can't really disassociate those two. If we are concerned about what we put in our children's mouth, we ought to be as concerned about how the product is grown and what is in the air that our child is breathing. And so those are intimately linked and they they come home to roost in our bodies and you know today we're seeing elevated rates of childhood asthma we're seeing uh, elevated rates of autism and learning disabilities 
Uh, and so we really need to think more holistically, and we can think more holistically. You know, this is one of the beauties of the Organic Foods Production Act, because it asks us when we regulate uh, materials, substances, and those do include some synthetics, by the way, in, uh, ag in organic agriculture. We have to, one of the starting questions is, number one, all these issues we're talking about today, essentiality. F first question. Number two, impacts on biodiversity central because if you're not concerned about the microorganisms in, in the soil and the impact that soil has on the health of plants and food production then you're not asking an essential issue that goes to the question of reasonability of introducing a material a toxic potentially toxic material into the environment but and Dan, then we I, get to health and the environment I, I just I just want to interject something on that note because that's a very important point but the problem is especially with these systemic pesticides, for example, with clothianidin. When I was talking to uh, Graham White, he introduced a gentleman who's uh, down south who's from Holland who actually grows organic uh, tulips. And we got into this discussion, and you don't even think about this uh, as uh, you know, a gardener, as a homeowner, what have you, when you're going to the nursery and you're buying shrubs, you're buying flowers, you're buying different plants for your landscape or for your home. How, mu how many of these chemicals are uh, already have been applied to these different plants? You don't even think about it because yeah. you assume that it's safe. And that yeah. is basically the job of the regulators, point blank. Yeah. No, it is. We, we assume in the marketplace that the regulators are protecting us, and we make that assumption, and it's, it's a false assumption, and that's why we have to get more transparency and labeling associated with how something is grown, where it comes from. We have to take power back through the pocketbook, through our pocketbooks, as we decide what we're buying in the marketplace. I mean, we have a whole other project on triclosan, which is an antimicrobial that's used you know, in toothpaste and hairbrushes, in socks and underwear, in prophylactics and, um, did I say toothbrushes and hairbrushes? I mean, th this is a chemical that is cashing in on the craze of, uh, you know, control against bacteria in the environment. And it, it, you know, we know it's hard to get, it, by the way, it's hard to get a liquid soap today that doesn't have a triclosan in it. Um, you have to look for it on the label, and, and often the manufacturer wants it on the label because they want their, their, their marketing fear, their marketing of fear that people have that they're exposed to these, uh, you know, E. coli and other bacteria that cause harm. Meanwhile, not recognizing that if you pick up any of the scientific literature, it says if we live in a sterile environment, we're going to be more reactive to bacteria that we normally live with anyway. So it's, again, causing uh, resistance, bacterial resistance to these chemicals, causing cross-resistance with antibiotics. We're introducing it into our waterways. It's an endocrine disruptor. Again, a classic example of how we have let the marketplace drive us, and EPA sits on its hands. So, you know, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to petition EPA, I'm going to sue EPA, I'm going to go up to Congress and seek reform, but you know what? At the end of the day, I'm going to rely on consumers to get more active to protect themselves and not buy that stuff and seek out, you know, in terms of local marketing, you know, the, the local food movement is really big right now, seek out growers who are not using these chemicals that are growing organically, and seek out products that don't incorporate and don't utilize. And the safe thing to do is, if there is no disclosure, find another product that does disclose, because chances are the product that doesn't disclose is produced with hazardous materials. And I couldn't have said it more perfectly, Jay. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> Uh, it's just been wonderful talking to you, and I definitely would love to have you back on the show again. Sure, this anytime. has been one of the best conversations about uh, the importance of organics and the importance of the power of your purchase, how every dollar equates to a vote. So thank you so much, Jay, for coming on the show. And how can folks get in touch with you and support Beyond Pesticides? Yeah, please do um, at our website, beyondpesticides.org. And we have an organic action page, so please get involved. We need your involvement. 
now, today, this week, please. And do you have a donation section on your site? Yes, it's right on our site. And feel free to call us at 202-543-5450, 202-543-5450. And uh, check out our website, beyondpesticides.org. And we also have a Facebook page as well, which you can link from there. A lot of good conversations going on. And again, gr we, we really want to work with you. The grassroots is going to make the changes that we need. Thank you, Jay. And folks, this has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon. And please check out beyondpesticides.org. <laughs>